The saga of Booby is the saga of tens and thousands of kids, many of them African American, across this country, who are deemed to be great athletes. Before the season, the season that was to be his crowning glory, his nirvana, his promised land, he got hurt. He tore his anterior cruciate ligament in his knee in an absolutely meaningless scrimmage before the season. And I still remember the location, Jones Stadium in Lubbock, Texas, where Texas Tech played. And it was August of 1988. And I remember the slant of the sun as it began to dip below the horizon. And of course, I will never, ever forget the look on his face. <clears throat> The sheer terror of an 18-year-old kid, because remember, he was only 18, who knew, instinctively knew, that his life had just died. Booby moved, moved off the line against the Paladero Dons, and everything was in pulsating motion. The legs thrust high, the hips swiveling, the arms pumping, the shoulder pads clapping wildly up and down like the incessant beat of a calypso drum. He went for 15 yards and it was only a scrimmage, but he wanted more. He always wanted more when he had the ball. Near the sidelines, he planted his left leg to stiff arm a tackler, but the leg got caught in the artificial turf and then someone fell on the side of it. And when he got up, he was limping and he could barely put any pressure on it at all. The team doctor, Weldon Butler, ran his fingers up and down the leg, feeling for broken, down, bro broken bones, and then he moved to the knee. Booby watched the trail of those fingers, his eyes ablaze and his mouth slightly open. With a tiny voice of a child, he asked Butler how serious it was, how long he would be out. The doctor just kept staring at the knee. You might be at six to eight weeks, he said quietly, almost in a whisper. Booby jolted upright as if he was wincing in the force of a shock. Oh, fuck, man. We won't know until we x-ray it. It may be worse if you don't, move, don't stop moving that way. You can't be serious, man. You got to be full of shit. Butler said nothing. Man, I know you're not talking about any six to eight weeks. Booby was placed on the red player's bench behind the sideline, and his black tops were slowly untied. The leg was placed in a black bag filled with ice to stop the swelling, and they turned to the team trainer, Trapper O'Connell. Is it going to ruin my season? He asked in a terrified whisper. Trapper had no response. Friday Nights was published in 1990, and 20 years later, I am proud to say that Booby and I are still friends. That in some ways, I've become his father figure, and he's become one of my sons, even though we do look like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito in the movie Twins. <laughs> we see each other, and we call each other, and we yell at each other, and we scream at each other, and we love each other, and we hate each other, and then we make up again, in other words, all the things that fathers and sons do. I have seen his life unfold since that injury in the twilight of Lubbock. And I can tell you, as he will be the first to tell you if he was here, and I wish he was here, because his message is much more powerful than anything I can give, that there is no way, no way you can function in life without an edge education. And I'm not saying that Booby was meant to be a physicist. He was not meant to be a doctor. But within him, because I know him, was the ability to learn. And there was the ability to learn how to cope. Because the most difficult thing in life you will find is not coping with success, but coping with failure. He blames himself. I didn't study enough. I didn't do enough. 
But I blame the athletic system of high school and college, not just in Odessa. It is all over the country that churns out tens of thousands of boobies. That their only reason to exist is the particular sport that they play. Booby actually got paid to play high school football. He got paid. When he was a junior, every Monday morning he would go to his locker room. And there, in an unmarked white envelope, would be as many dollars as yards he had gained the previous Friday night. He gained about 1,200 yards that year. That's $1,200. That's a lot of money to a kid from the bad side of town. So what incentive is there possibly going to be to care about school when you're being paid? There is no incentive. What incentive is there when you have and you were assigned a tutor and the tutor is really there to give you to the answers to the test the night before you take it? There is no incentive. How can you possibly care about school? I do believe that Booby loves me. I also am not an idiot. I know why he calls me most of the time to ask for money. There are some who say I should stop giving it to him, that it only enables his inability to hold a job or keep an apartment or have a car, and maybe that is true. Since I have given Booby money for all of those things, job training, rental deposits, getting him out of jail on bail, and much, much more, only to see all of it go down the drain. But there have been so many times when he has turned to me and he has said, I got nowhere to go. I got nowhere to turn to. I got no one who cares about me. Why is God doing this to me? He must have a plan. But what is the plan? When I hear that, it seems that the least I can do. The least is to let him know that he does have somewhere to turn. That there is at least a temporary relief, whether it lasts for an hour or a minute or five days, from a life that never turned out to be the way he thought it would be. And think of it, think of it, because you guys were close to his age. Think of it when you're 18 years old and your life is basically over. But then I think about the book, Friday Night Lights, and I think about the reaction to it, and I feel that if Friday Night Lights has saved one kid, one kid, from becoming another movie, if it has caused one coach, one administrator, one teacher, one parent to reconsider the notion that there is nothing in life more important than winning, that sports is the be-all and end-all. That education does not matter. If I have influenced anyone, then it has served the ultimate pur purpose of journalism and nonfiction writing to me, which is to expose and maybe, just maybe, to affect change. And that isn't depressing. <coughs> That is powerful. That is beautiful. Several years later, on my next book, it was called A Prayer for the City. It was a story about urban America told through the eyes of Philadelphia in the early 1990s. Philadelphia then was a city on the verge of a certain kind of death. People were leaving in droves. It had taxed itself to death. It had mismanaged itself to death. It had corrupted itself to death. It was teetering on the brink of a certain type of chaos. In the course of doing that book, I spent a great deal of time in the ghetto of North Philadelphia, which at that time looked like Dresden after the bombing in World War II. I had never seen and I've been to every big city in the country, never seen poverty like that in my life. And it is a shame 
an American shame, an American disgrace. And in the course of doing the book, I spent a great deal of time with the family with the last name of the Mazookas. The matriarch of the family was a woman, Fifi Mazooka. She was in her 60s when I met her. She was about 5'2". She was taking care of six great-grandchildren because all of their own parents were in prison. And yes, I know, that sounds awful and depressing as well. But I can honestly say I learned more from Fifi than maybe I have ever learned from anyone. I learned about the worthlessness and self-indulgence of self-pity. I learned about the beauty and the need of laughter. Most of all, I learned about the strength of the human spirit, whatever the situation, whatever the condition. I never once heard Fifi complain. I never once saw her give in. Even when there were times when it just seemed so hard, think of it when you're in your 60s and you're taking care of six great grandchildren under the age of seven. That's difficult, <coughs> difficult. And it's hard. It is so hard. But once again, it wasn't depressing to me. There was a beauty to it because being with her, seeing her, seeing her perseverance, seeing her nobility, <coughs> it was like being with the sun, this ray of hope wherever she went. Her laughter like a string of pearls. 